Hi, Sizzrin here with another mini cast. This time joined by Judd Cobbler, aka Moxjet, the CEO of 11 Hour Games. And we are going to talk about everything coming up for Last Epoch, a little bit behind the scenes, and what the job of a CEO entails. So, very excited for this one. I hope you guys enjoy, and let's right, just get right into it. Well, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name's Judd Kobler. I'm the game director for Last Epoch and CEO of 11th Hour Games. Uh, excited to be here and chatting with you today, Ziz. It's always a good time. I don't get to do enough of these, so it's always exciting to uh, join you on these. I'm glad to have you here. And uh, we have a bunch of questions for you. So very excited. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to be here. The number one question that I know a lot of people want to hear, how did Last Epoch start? Can you tell us a little yeah. bit like what inspired you and how, <laughs> what, what were the steps of starting? How do you make a game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a big one. Uh, so how did Last Epoch start? Um, I've always been obsessed with action RPGs. I mean, ever since the early Diablo 2 days before Lord of Destruction, I mean, I was just completely entrenched in love with action RPGs. Uh, you know, at this point, I've I've spent tens of thousands of hours, and that's that's probably not exaggerating, in playing Diablo 2, Path of Exile, Marvel Heroes, uh, Rest in Peace, Grim Dawn, uh, and, and other games in the genre. And so this genre has always been my hobby, and, and I've always been deeply in love with it, and I've always dreamed of making a game in the genre. So uh, it started by me going out to Reddit and finding other diehard action RPG enthusiasts and saying, hey, who wants to make a video game? I've got a lot of ideas. I spent a lot of time thinking about game design for action RPGs, and I think we can make one that, you know, kind of perfects the formula that makes these games great. And uh, to my surprise, I actually got quite a bit of traction there, and I was able to bring on a lot of other really talented individuals very early um, to, to make this After Hours project start to, you know, take, take hold. So uh, really going, going to Reddit. That's so cool. It's so yeah. crazy. How many people of the ones like that started like the message on Reddit? Are there a lot of those still around or is it like new people now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Some of those original folks are absolutely still with us in core positions. So Our cool. principal designer was probably the fourth person that messaged us. Uh, our our lore master is actually my cousin. Our our mothers are twins. Uh, wow. You guys, I think he actually just recently did a podcast, but uh, he always was playing action RPGs with me growing up, and he was always the guy who was really entrenched in the story and was a really good storyteller. Uh, so so he's still with us. Our our lore master. We still. Have have our lead level designer with us wow. from those days uh and you know that was from like the first eight so people oh and mike uh, you guys all know mike of course mike was mike was probably the ninth or tenth wow. person to message us there and you know he's he does pod or he does these streams every friday and he's uh you know he, he loves to be in here and, and talking with the community it's really for for all of us that started in the early days, it was kind of just this this pipe dream, right? And so to be at the point that we are with the project now is just incredible. It's it's a dream come true. It's so cool. It's been really cool for me to watch the game grow as well. Because I remember, I think it was like 2017, 2018, when, uh, when you offered a sponsorship to me to check out Last Epoch. A lot of people don't know this, but whenever I get offered a sponsor, I always ask, can I say negative things about the game? And to this date, Judd has had the best answer to this. And he was like, Ziz, if there's anything wrong with our game, you can roast it, you can drag it on your stream. We want to make a good game. It's been true because it was honestly like, especially some of the graphics look dog shit in the start. Oh my goodness. It was like, especially the, yeah, the, the purple void <laughs> monsters. I was like, what is this? Oh, I know. And it's transformed completely. It's like a whole, it's a whole new game. And it's been yeah, so cool yeah. to see the progress there. So it's it's been very cool. Uh, so I can see it's, how that would be amazing as a developer, especially. Yeah, it's certainly been a trip to go from, you know, after hours, no money at all. I yeah. mean, like, I think I bought some assets from an asset store with, like, my personal savings account and stuff like that. But, I mean, we, we went in no money whatsoever. And so to kick things off there especially when it comes to like uh, 3d models and stuff like that you know it, it, those are just things that there's a resource cost to develop those yeah. and we had no resources and so oftentimes some of the enemies that we create were like you know we, we would take one model and they were like okay we got to get a lot of mileage out of this yeah. one model and so our principal designer would be like you know what it needs we need to go add spikes to it. And then that would be a completely different monster. <laughs> be like oh this is the spiked quill bore and uh, so yeah it was uh, it was smart. it was and one of our favorite things right now, actually, is um, we have a 
we have a studio wide meeting uh, once a month. Now we just changed it to once a month. It was once a week, but that was the cadence was too quick uh, with the, the size of the team now. Um, but one of the coolest things that we do is we go and we show what models we're replacing in the game. And, and so we show the old version versus the new version. Oh, cool. And it's just, we all, we all get a good uh, gut laugh from what we have in the game right now versus uh, what it's, what's going to. And, and even then it's like, some of the custom models are now showing their age. And so we're placing some of the co the custom models we made back in like 2018, 2019 with new stuff. But uh, we're very happy with, with how the looks of the game are progressing and, and we're far from done there, but it's, it's quite a change, quite a change. I, I really love it as a design philosophy though, because I always felt like you guys were focusing on the game being good first rather than Absolutely. looking good. And uh, some other games that I was following didn't do that. It was like, oh dude, it looks so pretty, but... I have no content or nothing enjoyable to do, so it didn't really matter that much. So I think it's the right way to go for sure. Yeah, yeah. We didn't quite have the luxury of saying, hey, let's make the game look uh, amazing from the get-go. So it, it really was. It was an act of going and finding other people that just really, really knew the genre to its core and made really good game design decisions. And then we thought, you know, if we can gain some interest and go to Kickstarter and other action RPG players, we're like, hey, you know, they might be onto something. We could make progress from there. And, uh, to, to, you know, I don't know if we could have ever expected to get to the point that we are, uh, but the, you know, we're still, we're, there's still so much to go. There's still so much planned. Um, lots and lots of good stuff coming up. I'm excited to hear that. I, I have a really interesting question. So obviously there, you're not the only RPG on the market. There's so many out there. And how do you end up deciding, like, what do you copy? Like, like, you know, fireball, right? You don't need to reinvent fireball. Sure, so how sure. do you decide what to copy, where to innovate or where to improve on something else? Definitely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a good question. It would be hard to give a single answer there. You know, I think it's, I think it's just from the sheer volume of playing the games in the space. You can start to detect over a long period of time, what feels really good what doesn't feel so good, uh, what makes, you know, we, the one thing is the, the genre has a fantastic formula behind it. And you really don't want to break that formula that makes these games so mm. fantastic. And so you want to iterate on those and take the best of what exists and then, and then push those even further than they are. So things like, you know, if I'm, ta if I'm calling out the ones that I've played for uh, quite a long time, if I think about those features, things like server authority, uh, those those are things that not everybody that plays the genre to a very large extent understands how important it is to actually have server authority. Uh, because, you know, if you uh, play Grim Dawn, and I'm certainly not going to say anything bad about Grim Dawn, it is a, an incredible game that I absolutely adore. Um, but, you know, playing Grim Dawn, if you play Grim Dawn for 2,000, 3,000 hours, and you, you spend so much time getting one of these perfect pieces of gear, and then you know that, you know, your buddy can go in there and just hack in that exact same item it's kind of a defeating feeling and then it also yeah. takes away all the competitive potential features that you can add in so server authority was always oh, something can, that can i you viewed expand as really on important. what server authority is just to make sure everyone knows yeah 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 absolutely so so there is uh server authority and client authority so when when the logic exists on the client or on your computer, that means all the files exist there, all of the logic, how fast your character can run, it's all right. coded into what you have on your computer. And there are ways to go in there and decompile the code or get cheat engines and stuff like that. Say, you know, instead of running four units a second, I want to run 400 units a second. Right. And they can do that. And there's nothing that the game can say or do against that whatsoever. However, if the game is server authoritative, that says, you know, may I move to this point? And the server says, yes, you may. And then it gives that command to everybody else that, that you're sense. playing with. And then you move over there. So it prevents people from be being able to hack items because item generation is server authoritative. It's stored on a remote server. It's not stored on your computer. It prevents people from doing movement hacks and all kinds of things. Awesome. Uh, so if you're going to have any type of competitive feature to the game, like leaderboards or races mm -hmm. or just, you know, it, wanting to feel like the item that you found or crafted is, is yours and other people don't have that because you lucked into it or you put in the effort to get it. Um, it, it requires that the game is server authoritative. I wanted to make sure that when people played the game, their time was not spent dominated outside of the game. 
uh, checking resources or doing trade or things like that. So we've taken we've taken a lot of um, effort in making sure that you know our formulas for damage calculations and mechanics guides and stuff actually exist in game. If you go into Last Epoch and you press G, you have the game guide, and we put a lot of pride into making sure that if you open up that game guide. You will know how to play Last Epoch. You will know how to make builds. Uh, you you can go into Last Epoch. You can pick up a character, and you can feel like you are making choices that are not going to uh, bite you in the tail uh, when you get to end game. Most builds in Last Epoch can be made to work. Uh, trade, that's a that's a big one. You know, um, I adore Path of Exile. I've played uh, an immense amount of Path of Exile. I, I never liked being outside of the game so much to uh, yeah. have to trade items. And so with the trade plans that we have coming up, there's going to be a really fantastic way to stay in game. If you're going, uh, that's kind of a bigger conversation. Uh, but if you choose the merchant skilled faction, you'll be able to trade and we'll have an asynchronous bazaar system where you can actually browse items and get those things in game. You don't have to go outside of game and be trying to find sellers and all of the, all of the stuff that comes along with that. So, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to what to borrow from other games that exist in the genre and, and what to push on, I think it just comes from a sheer amount of playing the games. Um, skill system, that's that's one I should probably touch on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, our skill system, so every skill in Last Epoch does have its own individual skill tree. Uh, that is one of the things that early on we were like, wouldn't it be cool if... And we were like, I don't know, like that would be just an immeasurable, crazy amount of work to make it so that every skill has its own skill tree. But as a bunch of diehard ARPGers, we're like, oh, but we want it so much. And so we made it happen. And, you know, to this day, it does take a ton of time and effort to yeah. make that happen. But we think it's the coolest thing ever. And it gives us some benefits that some of ga the games in the genre don't have. Like we have these localized uh, dials and levers that we can pull to balance individual skills versus one another and th we're not having to rely on so many external things that can make it so that you know if if you turn this dial on this skill it makes this skill way too overpowered we can have that all in a localized cluster and balance it in that regard so uh yeah i mean it's all it's all kind of just from uh, understanding deeply how these systems have unfolded learning from the past uh wins and hiccups from other games in the genre so yeah it's just a, a lot of that yeah no it's uh it's very interesting to see it progress as well even the skill tree was like i, f I remember the first few skills it was sort of like it was very obvious choices and now it's uh the last time i was playing i was like oh well if i go over there then that's more useful so that's changed a little bit as well and it'll be Absolutely. awesome to see how that keeps up as well for skill trees you know because they do take a long time, it's kind of funny because there are some skills that we implemented earlier than others, and and some skills in yeah. the game like uh like like summon bear right now. Like we need to update the summon bear tree, and some of the later skill trees that we have are are phenomenal, and some of the upcoming stuff that we have planned for the unreleased masteries. Um, you know, there's there's so much that we've learned. There's so much more tech that we've implemented. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff coming for skill trees. And then we're also going to go back and, you know, uh, tidy up some of the old ones. We're going to remove ice thorns. Don't worry. That's really? Going away. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's awful. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Cool. As the CEO of a big game development company, what do, what do you do before? What do you do before this? Yeah, uh, it's certainly a non-traditional path. I, I played a lot of action RPGs, uh, but I actually, I ran a web agency oh. in, in Dallas, Texas. And so, uh, you know, f from that, I, I learned a number of things. I knew how to build teams. I knew how to execute on digital projects. I knew how to work with people and, and create great user experiences. I knew how to communicate with customers and things like that. And and so from that skill set, I said, you know, I, I probably have most of the skill set outside of you know, game development trading proper to go and build a game studio. And I, I of course, know the genre very well. So uh, I thought if I took that skill set and applied it over here, that I might be able to get something off the ground. And then, you know, I'd, I'd hire fantastic people that knew what they were doing in the spots that I wasn't very good at. And uh, yeah, it's it's gone. It's gone pretty well. I would say so. I would say yeah. so. Like, it's such a great choice right now because... I don't think there's ever going to be like one best ARPG out there. It's just going to be different things for different people. You guys are hitting such a nice middle ground 
between Path of Exile and Diablo. It's honestly perfect. Definitely, definitely. What does a day look like in your life? Like a normal day? Studio time or like the whole shebang? The whole day. Like a whole, whole day. day. What does it okay. look like? Okay, okay. Let me... I'll, I'll start with the studio time and then I'll kind of wrap it and like... Mm -hmm. Judd outside of studio yeah. time. So, That's perfect. Uh, you know, studio time kicks off. We have a number of team standups. Um, you know, w one thing is that we, we are completely remote distributed studios. So we have people in over 20 countries working on last epoch at the moment. So, uh, we do have our team standups in the morning. We, you know, we have our, our gameplay, we have our art, uh, we have our operations stand up, all of those things. So I try to, uh, attend as many of those as I can. And I try to swap it up because we actually have some that are, uh, adjacent to each other. So I have to pick the ones that I go to, um, and then I guess depending on the time within the development cycle, the day changes quite a bit. So in the beginning of a development cycle, uh, there's a lot of patch planning. There's a lot of game design meetings. There's a lot of uh, making sure that the patch that we just released is being um, being updated properly. And if there's any bugs or outstanding things that we need to fix that we're hot fixing very quickly. And so uh, the, the beginning of a new development cycle is really fun because we're like hot off the heels of people in the game enjoying what we just released, uh, seeing seeing how that's going and then we're also planning for how we're going to execute the next development cycle um once we go into uh around the mid development cycle there's a lot more production meetings seeing how things are going we have our directors coming in and spot checking things and making sure that everything is going uh to plan and then as we get closer to a patch release there's a lot of like uh, like i just got off of a go no go call for 0 0.9.1 so we say these are the features this is the state they're in this is uh you know do we feel good about releasing this should we hold this a little bit longer for either a hot fix or the subsequent patch things like that uh and then there's, you know, all the business side of things. I, I am the CEO, so that does take up an amount of time, probably 10 to 15 hours a week. Uh, but I think probably the the most fun things that we have during our studio time is uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we have a one hour multiplayer session that the entire team comes to. Uh, and, you know, we test out the new stuff that's making its way in. We give feedback, everything like that. So it's a good chance that's for awesome. the entire team to get to play the game that they're making. Uh, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we also have our game design meetings, which of course is my absolute favorite thing to do here is talk about the game design. So um, those what we'll do is we'll go and we'll aggregate a number of topics that we're going to talk about during that time. Uh, I'll go out there, uh, as as you've probably seen, I'm very active on Reddit and, and also our forums. So I'll go out there and I'll say, uh, you know, what's the community saying? Let's go take some of their ideas. We'll we'll put, we'll put them into these game design meetings and talk about them. And uh, you know, we do we do we take a lot of suggestions that the community makes in how we should be developing or altering the game. Uh, and I, I I've always thought that's very important because you want to listen to the people that are playing your product for hundreds of hours they know it they know it better than even sometimes and oftentimes we do hmm. um that's going a little off off uh, yeah. tangent here uh so the rest of my day uh i have four kids uh so when i started <laughs> when i started last epoch um you know i i had my web agency and stuff like that so i was always already working quite a bit of hours uh, i had my third uh, daughter, my, my third child on the way. Uh, and I said to my wife, I'm going to start up a game studio. Um, and, and, you know, she was skeptical to say the least. Uh, but so I, I've got four kids. I wake up, I usually help my wife get the kids ready to get to school. Uh, my, my youngest is almost a year old now. So it's, you know, also helping with baby and stuff like that. Uh, I, I catch up with the global news and the industry, the gaming news. Uh, I try to exercise in the morning when I can, uh, I, I schedule that for about three times a week. Um, and then after studio hours, uh, usually I'll have dinner with my family. We'll, we'll eat and I'll read them stories at night, stuff like that. We'll put them down. I'll spend a little bit of time with my wife. And then it's like, I, I'll go to, I'll either go to Reddit or our forums and I'll browse through that, see how things are going. Uh, I'll communicate with people externally there. Uh, and then I'll end up either late at night playing a game for a little bit or, you know, watching, watching something with my wife or something like that. But that's, that's the typical day to day in my life at the moment. That's a, that sounds like a, that's a lot of work. I only have one child, so it's like I can't imagine how doing all of this and yeah, kids yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's good because my my oldest is now thirteen, so uh, having three 
that's like that's the hard number but once you get to four they start like the oldest starts to help take care of the youngest and they all kind of you know it's uh four was easier than three i'll say that makes sense that makes sense yeah yeah how many people did you say work at last epoch now yeah uh we are up to uh the latest is is probably right around 75 uh and so this is this is cool it, it's, it's always felt like we are uh changing the tires as we're driving the car as a kind of analogy there because uh you know we've grown from just a few people i mean eight people or so in the beginning to where you know we're, we're bringing on 20 plus people each year that we're running the studio and so it's you know reorganizing the org chart and getting more specialized people in different uh skill sets and things like that it's a ton of fun i mean once we get people once we bring in like a, you know uh, a new person that can do something better than we ever have if we bring somebody in that's like really good at doing cinematic and stuff like that for these patch trailers it's just a it's an absolute joy to be like oh we have we have this person that can make these cool things now um but but yeah we're at uh we're at 75 or so and that is it feels big compared to what we had previously but you know we're we're still pretty small in comparison to some of these uh big players in the space but it's 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 kind of it it's fun it's like the healthy uh kind of underdog situation that we going get going on is that including all the testers and stuff or and QA or is that like just developers yeah yeah so we we do have all of our QA and all of our art department in house and that is that is from what I understand, not super traditional for a lot of game studios, okay. but we have we have a pretty cool culture where, you know, a lot of our QA I've plucked directly out of the community. It's people that have just like they're playing Last Epoch for 15 hours a day and giving us feedback in a manner that we can actually absorb and act on. And so it's like, well, if you're doing it and we trust you to do it, like let's just go ahead and let's pay you to do it instead of having you out there just kind of shouting into the void. Uh, and so our our QA team is is a, a kind of special because they do test the game, but they're also very tightly with us in our game design side as well. So it's uh so that's fun. But we also have all of our art team internal. I, I will say that we were working with working with some external agencies right now. To uh, we have like chapter cinematics coming up for uh for all of our chapter content and and things like that and so we have we have a lot of people that are working on that externally at the moment but but for the main game content pipeline everybody's in house cool so just to get a rough idea like how how many like game developers would be out of those let's see um game developers so we have a lot of our developers kind of go back and forth, uh, and some of our even our QA have elevated into developers. Some of some of them have elevated That's into cool. developers. I, I guess it would be hard to give an exact number, but out of these seventy five, there's probably fifteen, seventeen developers. Wow. Uh, that I think that's probably pretty close to accurate. That's very cool, and I really want to touch on something you said. You are fully remote, like that. I really want to hear a little yeah. bit about the ups and downs of that, especially during yeah. COVID. That must have been a big buff there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, COVID was interesting because, you know, everybody was so frantic and it, it it changed a bunch of people's timelines and people had to adapt to it. And like, that's all we ever knew, right? That's that's how we started. And so, um, you know, COVID didn't impact the studio super heavily it you know i i will say that it did impact a, a, a few team members individually yeah. which is you know sad but uh it didn't really impact the studio in a large degree uh probably the the coolest things about being a completely remote studio is that we get to we get to source all of our talent and passion from anywhere in the world uh, and and that's that's a huge buff you know there's there's no carve in Texas, True. Uh, unfortunately, right? Uh, our principal designer and our creative director over there in the UK, there's not an equivalent. Those guys are fantastic. And I have the chance to bring them on to work with Last Epoch because we are fully remote. Uh, you know, we I think I think we're in 20, 21 different countries at the moment. So, I mean, we are like really, really distributed. So cool. Our sound, ad- sound designers in Australia, we have a number of people of Canada. We have a large portion of our art team is in Brazil and Colombia. Uh, so, so we're all all over the map and it's a it's a really good time but 
you know, it's it's cool because we all get to rally under the fact that we really love the game and the genre. And so even though there's differences and time zones and cultures and stuff like that, we're all really excited to make Fireball more fiery, you know? So <laughs> it, it works out. It works out. And I think also situations like like mine where I've got kids and we have a lot of people in the studio that have kids and stuff like that. Uh, being able to get that time back, not having the commute, not having to worry about all of the, you know, being in person. Um, it does. It gives a lot of people a lot of time back. So I think that's that is something that is really great about a lot of the workforce shifting to remote, even outside of VHG. But we'll say there's probably some cons that come with it. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to ask is, about next. There's certainly things that you can work through, but, you know, there's like collaboration. And, and they, again, I had not run a game studio. I did run a web agency where we were in an office and things like that. And there is a kind of nice uh, ability to, you know, walk over to somebody's desk and see what they're working on and say, you know, what if you just like scooted that up a couple pixels and yeah. stuff like that you know so so there there's probably an argument that collaboration can be easier when you're in a a physical studio um we have found ways to do pretty darn well uh without being in a physical studio you know we're constantly on video calls and sharing screen and doing the whiteboards that are digital and stuff like that That's um cool. yeah yeah and then i don't know maybe like uh one thing that we I talk with my HR manager quite a bit about is like, how do we get more of the whole like water cooler chat? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, there is, there's kind of something special to where when you're in a, when you're in a, a, an office and you know, you guys are both in the break room or something like that, you have to like know who your colleague is a little bit more on a personal level. And so we, we try to uh, emulate that a bit with having like uh, game nights and, and having times where we say, you know, uh, there are times where team team managers can go and take their team and just play games during the day and just chat. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a decent sum up of, of yeah. the remote situation that we have going on. Well, and will there ever be an office? <laughs> you know, uh, no, there, there won't. Um, well, never say never. Uh, there's no plans to yeah. have an office. Uh, at this point, I think we're so far beyond that. We have so many uh, important people in other regions that it would be very, very difficult to have a physical office. Uh, now, I will say that uh, on April 1st in, I think, 2019 and 2021, I did get the team very good in this regard. I did tell them that we were uh, standing up in EHG <laughs> studio, and I let that ride for like four hours. And uh, I, got, I, got some, I got some people pretty, pretty well there. But after, uh, <laughs> after 21, when the team started to grow a little bit, um, it, it, it came to realize that April 1st, April Fool's Day, isn't a custom that every uh, country <laughs> is familiar with. So, you know, some people didn't quite get the joke. And I was like, oh, okay, I, pr I probably need to not do that. That's funny. That's a, that's a that's pretty great. big, that's a pretty big upset if people were like, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, no, probably, probably not. Probably not an office in the future. What about uh, meetups? Obviously, Path of Exile is doing Exile Con now. Is there going to yeah. be a Last Epoch Con? Yeah, Last Epoch Con. That would be uh, that would be awesome. Uh, I, you know, I don't think that we're quite there for a Last Epoch Con just yet, uh, but we definitely do have a lot of conversations about you know going to more conventions because you know we also have the excuses like we get to meet up with more team members if we go to these conventions. Even if the uh, return on investment for actually attending a convention isn't quite there, we do have an ROI of getting to actually meet up and hang out and see our colleagues that we work yeah. with so closely. Um, so yeah, we we definitely want to have more meetups especially post 1.0 uh, requires time and money and, and hopefully post 1.0 we have a little more of both of those and we get That'd the chance cool. to go out and hang out with people uh gdc gamescom things like that yeah we're, we're very interested in going to all of those types of things and meeting up recently you launched multiplayer in last epoch but multiplayer wasn't in when the game launched can you tell me yep. what, what are some of the struggles that comes with that <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's probably a gigantic list. Um, a lot of, a lot, it's very, very hard to have a single player game and then retroactively fit in some of the multiplayer aspects. And we had always planned on the game being server authoritative and we had taken stabs to make the game, uh, multiplayer compatible, but there was a lot of times where we would get to a point and we would look at the code base and we would look at how it's structured and we're like, crud guys, like we're going to have to go back and redo 
most of what we had just done here. And I think we did that. I think we're wow. on iteration number three. Wow. And, and so, you know, it's, if I, if I had known then what I know now, you have to have some brilliant engineers to have a server authoritative global game and, and make that work functionally well across the board. Um, so, you know, it was, um, we were fully funded off of early access sales. And so having, you know, these, these top tier developers, it was hard to come by. It was hard to find people okay. that, you know, have that skill set. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it. If you're going to make a server authoritative game, uh, definitely, definitely have a little bit of funding in your pocket and, and do it from the get go. It's, it would probably be way, way easier. Makes sense. Uh, I can't yeah. even imagine how difficult that is. And definitely as a final question, what are you looking forward to the most that isn't in the game yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's so much this, uh, you know, we're, we're not even, I, I tell the team and I, I tell the community this too. 1.0 for last epoch is, is just kickoff. Like that is, that is when we're at the point where the game, like, I feel like, okay, the game is now at a point where I can confidently go be, tell people like, this is a game that is worth your time and money and energy, and you should be looking at it. And that's, that's, you know, we're we're at 0.9.1 is coming up here very soon um but but as far as what is coming in the future of the game there's there's so much you know um we have two big expansions for the in-game system the monolith already planned we have a lot more ideas for additional masteries and classes that we want to have brought into the game uh you know which is ma making skills and masteries and classes is probably the the team's very favorite thing to do so after we have these 15 masteries out the door we're certainly not done we're certainly awesome. not done uh yeah so i'm, I'm really excited about th those things um we need to have more more of that ultra hard content, that aspirational content that people can, you know, the people that are going to spend hundreds of hours making their build perfect and they have something that they can go and aspire to kill. We need to have more of those things in game. Right now we have things like T4 Jewelra, which is, you know, kind of scaling content. We want things that are less scaling and more like, you know, this is the pinnacle boss where you can check, uh, check mark your, your build. Uh, so, so we have things like that coming in. We have new item types. Um, I can't get way too into that, but yeah. I'm really excited about some of the item type stuff that we have coming in the 1.x series. Um, that's gonna, you know, we we know that right now after you plug those 20 points into the skill trees, like that's a really exciting thing is when you have 20, you're you're working towards those 20 points to plug into your skill tree, and and once that's done. It kind of feels like there is a like a cap in progression, which doesn't feel good. Um, there's things that we are going to do to make it so that, you know, when you get to the end of that line, it does feel like, oh, gosh, there's just so much more. There's so much more cool. for me to do and be excited about. Um, let me think here. Um, I mean, quality of life features. There's still plenty of quality of life features. People constantly ask, like, why don't the keys stack yet? Right. And so it's like, yeah, the keys should absolutely stack in last epoch. And it's funny. It's like, there's, there's plenty of, um, there's plenty that actually goes into that, that people probably don't consider. So there's plenty of quality of life things that we know that we want to put into the game that might aren't that, that aren't quite in there yet. We have our trade faction system yeah. coming in. We have these, I mean, the story itself, the story itself isn't complete yet. We have some great new chapter content coming. Um, there's a lot. Again, you know, we we really we plan to have epoch in development for hopefully eight, ten plus years. We want to make this game something that people can really view as their hobby and they can be fully invested in playing last epoch and enjoy every moment of it for however long they want to play the game. So uh, there's there's just so much that we want to have come into the game that we're excited about. And and we have up to probably one point three or so almost planned uh at least the major wow. features that are going to come out with these things uh but yeah there's 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 a lot also time travel like there's so much cool stuff that we want to do with time travel right now you know we're we're a time travel action rpg is how we sell ourselves but it's like there's so much that we need to do to make that really really exciting and sell time travel even yeah. further and so we have we have plans there uh okay. so lots of stuff 1.0 will be kickoff for last epoch and then you know the sky's the limit hopefully we get to develop this game for 20 plus years and we just enjoy every second of it 
Dude, thank you so much for joining me for this interview. It was a blast and taking time out of your crazy busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. It's a ton of fun. Uh, I look forward to getting to do more of these. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much, Ziz. We really appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you so much.